Planning Board. It's now called to order. My name is Nancy Hafford and I'm the chair of the board. I will now start by the meeting by calling roll to the count for the board members that are present on this call. When you hear your name, please say aye. Mr. Schweitzer. Mr. Schweitzer. Here. Yeah. Here. Yep. Okay. Ms. Panero. Mr. Hartman. Here. Mr. Halipka. Here. Mr. Johnson. Ah. Uh. Ms. Wolfson. <clears throat> Mr. McGinnis. Here. Mr. Heckman. Aye. Mr. Heinel. Mr. Perlow. Mr. Warren. Hello. Mr. Caligari. Mr. Fotis. Mr. Avery. Here. Thank you. Please join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, individual with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Tracy, are there any changes to the tentative agenda as published? Madam Chair, there are no changes. Thank you. In the September 16th email, you received draft minutes from the September 2nd, 2021 meeting. Has everyone had an opportunity to review the draft minutes? Aye. Aye. If everyone has, can I entertain a motion to accept the minutes as they've been circulated? Motion. Motion. Uh, Madam Chair, just a technical thing. Um, it says that I was present in the, in the meeting and actually I was not. Um, okay, can we, Marcia, can we make that for a correction? And then I believe on page two, the minutes that is July 15th and it probably is a carryover from the previous meeting and probably should be September 2nd. Thank you. Marsha, can uh, you can you make those changes to the minutes? Yes, I can. I missed the first one, but um, I can get it off of the recording. Okay. Yeah, I have and it then, as well, Marsha. We're good. So then, do I have a motion to accept the minutes as corrected? Motion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. This evening, we had an opportunity for further discussion. Can you, anyone that's got their microphones off, if you could mute it right now, please? Thank you. This evening, we have an opportunity for to further discuss then vote on cycle 39 water supply and sewage master plan amendments, which was introduced to the board on June 17th, 2021. A public hearing as was then conducted on July 15th, 2021, a motion to approve the amendments at the September 2nd, 2020 meeting was tabled. Staff from the Department of Public Works and Transportation are here to answer any further questions that the board might have before we take a vote. Would Mr. Bokey from the Department of Public Works and Transportation like to add anything further this evening? I would not at this moment, but if there are questions, I will be here to answer them. Are there any questions for Mr. Bokey? Mr. Bokey, it's, it's your recommendation that we do this to create um, some duplication and some backup for the sewer and water 
uh, right? Specifically the water system, uh, the, the Department of Public Works and Transportation is looking to create a new water main in Ebenezer Road, which would allow us to, to loop the system. If there was ever a, a, a break, we would still be able to feed a significant part of this peninsula. Okay, thank you. I have a question. Uh, as I understand it, Councilwoman Bevins had uh, formed their committee to look at this area and they were uh, supposed to be issuing a report of some sort. Has that been completed yet? I don't have any knowledge on that. Um, I'm not sure if anybody else on the on the call does. Well, or Mr. 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 All I know is that. Go ahead. I'm sorry, Mr. Harry. All, all I know is that the uh, councilwoman supports this uh, project 100%. And I've spoken with her about this, and she's uh, behind the project. Okay, thank you. Oh. Thank you, Mr. Hart Mr. Hartman. To your question, the committee has not finished its work uh, and made any recommendation back to the uh, councilwoman yet. Okay. Are there any other questions? If not, thank you, Mr. Boki. Also at the meeting this afternoon is Ms. Shao from the Department of Planning available to answer any questions on Cycle 39 Water Supply and Sewage Master Plan Amendment. Board members, do you have any other questions for her? All right, if there are no further questions, I will now entertain a motion to approve Cycle 39 water supply and sewer master plan amendments with an amendment that we we want we have to pick a particular and and i want to go with the one that says we would add we would allow them to have the water and sewer and which motion is that in uh, it's i i think it's b or whatever the, the i you have to read the motions off to so i know exactly which one is Marsha is actually going to share the staff report that serves the different staff recommendations to help you. <clears throat> Todd, I, I think you're right. I think it's option B. It's the W3S3 proposal recommended by uh, EPS. Yeah, that's the one. Okay, so do you want to um, refrain your rephrase your motion, Todd? I would like to make a motion to approve um, the water and sewer plan with option B in it. Okay, do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any, op any opposed? Nay. Nay. Okay. Motion passes. Thank you. Okay, next. Next on the agenda, there will be a presentation from the Department of Planning staff led by community planner, Western Sector, Mr. William Zamansky on the Pikesville Commercial Revitalization Act Action Plan. Mr. Zabansky. Uh, as after he's finished his introduction, I will call for a separate motion to set a public hearing on the subject matter. Please welcome Mr. Zamansky to fill us in on the Pikesville Commercial Revitalization Action Plan. Okay, good evening, uh, Marsha. If you could bring that presentation up. Great, thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, good uh, uh, Madam Chair and fellow planning board members. Um, Bill Skabinski, I am a community planner for the western sector of the county, and in particular, I've been working in the Pikesville area for um, nearly six years now. Um, just real quick, I'd also like to thank uh, Director Lafferty for being here and for his support over the past several months, and a special thanks to 
uh, Deputy Director Mante for her support throughout the several years of working with Pikesville, as well as Dennis Wirtz, who is now happily retired, and um, all the other planning staff that have assisted um, throughout this process. And, and of course, a big thank you to the uh, Pikesville uh, community and, and the Pikesville Chamber of Commerce. So with that, I will start uh, next slide, please. I just wanted to give a quick snapshot of the timeline that we've been working through over the past uh, about five years now. Uh, starting in April of 2017, you'll see we began a Pikesville commercial revitalization study. Uh, this timeline really just shows some of the key items that have occurred throughout these past several years leading up to today. So you can see that there's been quite extensive um, background and research and analysis of the Pikesville area, as well as several rounds of community and stakeholder input, uh, as well as publishing the um, Pikesville study, and community workshops, and more input and surveys and so forth. So uh, now here we are, August of. Uh, or excuse me, September of 2021, now getting the uh, plan ready for hopefully getting it adopted. Next slide, please. Wanted to cover some of the commercial revitalization programs that are available in Pikesville um, that the action plan does seek to try to take more advantage of. So here are some of the major revitalizations that the Pikesville commercial revitalization can and has taken advantage of. Um, you can see that there is the commercial revitalization is within the red, bo red boundary that you'll see on the map. The purple area is what's known as the Northwest Gateway Sustainable Community Area, which also overlaps with the commercial revitalization district. So within that CRD, there are programs such as the commercial revitalization action grant, architect on call, building improvement loan, as well as the commercial revitalization tax credit. Additionally, within that uh, Pikesville CRD is the commercial design review panel, as well as having adopted commercial revitalization design guidelines. Next slide, please. So this new Pikesville uh, Commercial Revitalization Action Plan kind of took the uh, three sub areas that had been identified in prior plans and um, kept them the same, but also kind of reworded them to bring them more into the modern, modern day. So you'll see here these three subsections, uh, one being the suburban commercial in the yellow, the central business district in red, um, is what, being classified as more of a high impact area for revitalization. And lastly, as we get closer down to the city line, there's the commercial, uh, neighborhood commercial in the, in the green. Next slide, please. I also wanted to just give a quick snapshot of some of the existing uh, conditions and the various types of community input re we've received. Um, which shows why this new action plan is important to the Pikesville District. As you see, these three photos, uh, the commercial area has been neglected. Um, it's really needed of re revitalization, and this action plan seeks to guide and uh, revitalize that process by identifying achievable goals, as well as detailing the various action items needed to achieve those goals. So, some of the common issues that uh, you know, I've observed as well as hearing from the community throughout the years are such issues as the, the deteriorated streetscape and facades, traffic con uh, congestion and parking issues, trash and litter, a lack of district identity and sense of place. Uh, there's really no type of community park um, or uh, lots of public open space as well as issues with walkability and connectivity. Slide, please. 
Now I wanted to show the various forms of community engagement uh, and input that we conducted uh, throughout both the study and the drafting of the action plan. Since 2017, and in some cases even prior to that, we have engaged the community in an open dialogue to discuss these issues, um, gathering input, um, and starting to develop a broader vision for the Pikesville Commercial Revitalization District. So you can see here are the various uh, community and stakeholder meetings, as well as exercises that we conducted um, since uh, 2017. Um, you know, this does not include you know, various types of other forms of community discussion that I've had or um, you know, out on the ground field visits with various community leaders and so forth. These are really some of the, the bigger um, either input meetings or exercises that we held. Um, so along with these various input meetings, surveys and exercises, a lot of recommendations were documented and conveyed by various Pikesville community groups and highly active residents many of which I've met on several occasions and discussed a variety of revitalization ideas, most of which are now contained within this action plan. So you, you can see, beginning with the commercial, uh, revi uh, commercial district study, we started out with individual community and business association meetings. Um, we did meet with uh, the 10 active community associations in the area. Um, as well as conducted confidential stakeholder interviews with 11 business stakeholders, conducted a strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats analysis, of which we received 53 submissions. We conducted online surveys and mapping exercises, where we received 55 submissions, as well as additional meetings and paper surveys um, distributed at the Pikesville Library and Senior Center. We received 25 submissions subsequent to that. And lastly, once we presented the study um, and conducted table exercises to the wider uh, Pikesville community, we had approximately 75 to 100 participants that showed up to that meeting. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Oh, thank you. Um, so here you'll see this is the uh, community input and study presentation um, that was conducted on April of 2019. Presented the commercial revital, uh, commercial district study to the community. While at this meeting, we covered the various main themes and issues apparent throughout the study um, and the various types of input that we've collected. So in addition to presenting the study's results, we also conducted uh, hands-on table ex exercises with all attendees. Uh, some of the main input themes that were apparent throughout this exercise were streetscape and beautification, and again, traffic and parking, walkability, promotion and marketing, business outreach, um, as well as zoning and design. The table exercises were geared towards an analysis of the CRD and its surrounding area. And at the end, um, table reports shared the various types of input that was gathered. Next slide, please. In addition with uh, the input that we've already discussed, we also uh, conducted, uh, excuse me, uh, so subsequent to the various input that we collected throughout the study and presenting the study, this uh, rolled into working on a revitalization, which ultimately formed into uh, this action plan that we're here for tonight. The plan was published online, which allowed the community to provide their comments and suggestions on the plan. During that initial period of community feedback, I received uh, approximately 20 individual feedback letters from the community. Uh, I did receive other feedback uh, since then, particularly from some of the larger and more active community groups. And once it was decided to begin this adoption process, I solicited for more community feedback. Um, 
and received three individual submissions uh, back in August. So in some shape or form, the majority of that feedback that I received uh, on the action plan has been incorporated um, in, in, into the draft plan. Next slide, please. The action plan approach um, is really community-based, community input-based. Um, really wanted to really work towards um, creating more achievable goals, something that really focuses on the CRD as well as that high impact area, uh, as well as high impact projects in the CRD, and really also trying to get the community, um, various business uh, stakeholders, as well as the county to collaborate on all these various uh, goals and the action items needed to complete those goals. Next slide, please. So I also wanted to talk a little about some of the current revitalization efforts that are going on right now that are part of the action plan. So we do have, uh, as of fiscal year 2022, approximately 235,000 for streetscape improvements, looking at replacing things like trash cans, replacing benches, some minor streetscape repairs, landscaping and lighting, and possibly some public um, parking wayfinding, wayfinding signage. Um, also, as I spoke to earlier, the Commercial Revitalization Action Grant, or CRAG, um, is an annual grant that will award um, up to $10,000 to a business association. So FY 2021, there was actually 30,000 uh, extra money came out of the uh, CARES Act funds. All of that went towards uh, marketing and branding as well as farmers market support. And moving into FY 2022, we do anticipate about $10,000 um, to go towards uh, whatever project that the uh, Chamber of Commerce decides to submit for. Next slide, please. So um, that's all I had for bulk of the presentation. Um, I do thank everyone for being here this evening. If anybody has any questions, uh, I'll be glad to try to answer those. Also, you'll see on the screen, there's the tentative dates for the next two uh, planning board hearings for the, the public hearing, as well as the planning board vote. Um, does anybody have any questions? Thank you, I Mr. Savansky. Did someone say they had a question? Yeah, I do, Bill. Um, is the entire um, report for action plan available? Is it online? Yes, it is available online. And um, I thought that it had been sent out to everybody with the um, meeting information and agenda, but it is available online and uh, be glad to send it to you as well. No, I got uh, it. I'm just say, saying that for the benefit of the public so uh, that they could take gotcha. a look at it. But one comment I have is I think it's outstanding how much public participation you, you were able to get in the formation of the plan. It's pretty, pretty amazing. Yes, thank you. Any other questions from the board? Thank you, Mr. Sabansky. And you just don't watch over Pikesville, you watch over Towson too, and we greatly appreciate try, it. Try to with think, the credit for sure. And I think that's one thing that uh, the public doesn't realize that um, it's not just these meetings that you do. You guys go into all different areas of Baltimore County and do deep dives. So thank you so very, very much. So since there, no, since there are no other further questions, can I entertain a motion to set a public hearing? Sure. Uh, be it moved that the Baltimore County Planning Board set a public hearing regarding the Pikesville Commercial Revitalization Action Plan for Thursday, October 7th, 2021 at 5 p.m. 
Thank you, Mr. Halipka. Do I hear a second? Second. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 There, we, there we go. Thank you. Now, Ms. Tracy, will you fill us in on legislation recently passed by the County Council following our last meeting? Oh, sorry. Is there anything on the Landmark Preservation Committee first, Mrs. Tracy? Yes, Madam Chair, thank you. At their September 9th meeting, the, or the Landmarks Preservation Commission voted to issue 10 certificates of appropriateness to the following properties. The Struthman property at 119 Smithwood Road in Catonsville, the Bricado property at 210 Morris Avenue in Lutherville, the Hisley property located at 1507 Bologna Avenue in Lutherville, the Boobnash property at 14 Chatsworth Avenue in Glendon, the Brooks <coughs> property at 3609 Blackstone Road in Fieldstone, the Nabin property at 1722 Kurtz Avenue in Lutherville, the Tishkevnik property at 322 Central Avenue, Glendon, the Bear property at 4607 Prospect Avenue in Glendon, the Dumbarton House, um, which is Baltimore County Public Schools property at 300 Dumbarton Road in Towson, and the National Bank of Cockeysville and Carriage House and Setting. It's the DeCourse property located at 10914 York Road, Cockeysville. Additionally, the Landmarks Preservation Commission voted to issue two notice of to proceed to the following properties. The Brooks property at 3609 Blackstone Road in Fieldstone and the Dishkevic property at 322 Central Avenue in Glendon. Finally, the Landmarks Preservation Commission voted not to support the nomination of one property to the Baltimore County preliminary landmarks list following a public hearing. And that is the Bosley Mansion and Grounds and setting located at 400 Georgia Court in Towson. Thank you so much, Ms. Tracy. Now, will you fill us in on the legislation <laughs> that recently passed by the County Council? <laughs> yes, Madam Chair and members of the board. Um, recent County Council legislation of interest to the board starts with Bill 76-21, Zoning Regulations, Cemeteries, and Burial Grounds. For the purpose of permitting nat natural burial grounds, including conservation burial grounds, as an alternative burial ground in certain areas of the county, defining and redefining certain terms, providing certain conditions applicable to natural burial grounds and a, cons and a conservation burial ground. Bill 80-21, Zoning Regulations, Temporary Use Trailers. For the purpose of permitting the temporary business use of trailers in certain areas throughout the county under certain circumstances. Bill 81-21, Planned Unit Developments, Community Benefit, Capital Improvements. For the purpose of amending the Capital Improvement Community Benefit Provision for an application for a planned unit development. Resolution 99-21, Adoption of the 2020 Triennial Review of the Baltimore County Water Supply and Sewerage Plan. A resolution adopting the report of the 2020 Triennial Review of Baltimore County Water Supply and Sewerage Plan. Resolution 100-21, amendments to the Baltimore County Water Supply and Sewerage Plan. A resolution, excuse me, a resolution to amend the Baltimore County Water Supply and Sewerage Plan uh, 2020. Resolution 112-21, approval continuation of a state of emergency executive order 2021-022. A resolution approving the continuation of a state of emergency declared by the county executive on August 23rd, 2021. That completes the report. Thank you very much, Ms. Tracy, appreciate that. Now, this is the conclusion of our agenda right now for our planning board meeting. So I need a motion to adjourn, but then we will immediately reconvene for a public hearing. Motion to adjourn. Sure. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, thank you. Now we're reconvening. Now we're gonna start our public hearing. And Good evening again, and welcome to the Baltimore County Planning Board public hearing. 
for resolution 4621 minimum width requirement um, uh, townhouses and group houses. The public hearing is called to order. I'm Nancy Hafford, the chair of the Baltimore County Planning Board, and we'll now start our meeting with the roll call of all of our members that are present. So after you say I, if you can mute yourselves. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Schweitzer. I. Ms. Panero. Ms. Panero. Mr. Mr. Hartman. Aye. Mr. Halipka. Mr. Johnson. Mr. Miss Wilson. Aye. Mr. McGinnis. Aye. Mr. Heckman. Here. Mr. Heinel. Here. Mr. Perlow. Here. Mr. Warren. Here. Mr. Caligari. Mr. Fotis. Mr. Avery. Here. Thank you all. At the planning board meeting, September 2nd, 2021, Mrs. Jennifer Nugent, Division Chief and Development Review of Baltimore County Planning Board, introduced resolution 46-21, minimum width requirements for town homes and group homes. Mrs. Nugent is here to further present on resolution 26-21, minimum width requirements for townhomes group homes to the board. Following Ms. Nugent's presentation, we will also hear from Mr. Isaac Ambrose, Director of Legislative and Regulatory Affairs from the Maryland Building Industry Association, and members of the public will have an opportunity to speak. Please join me in welcoming. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and good evening, uh, fellow planning board members. Um, I'm going to do a, a brief presentation um, from the presentation I did at the last meeting, um, which was based on the report that we um, posted to the county website, as well as um, furnished to you all ahead of the last meeting. Um, can anybody see my screen okay? Yes. Can you all? Uh, okay. Yes, we can see it. I just want to make sure you can hear me too. Sorry. Um, so uh, resolution 4621 was re request acted by enacted by the County Council for you all, the planning board, to review the laws, regulations, and policies associated with the minimum width requirement um, for townhouses or group houses, and to study the feasibility and efficacy of amending the minimum width requirement and report its findings and recommendations on those results and studies back to the county council. This request was a result of a proposal by the Baltimore County Chapter of the Maryland Building Industry Association, uh, otherwise known as MBIA. Our department conducted research and analysis over many weeks and prepared and provided you all the report, as I mentioned previously. So just to recap. Um, townhouse development in Baltimore County is permissible within the Ertl and growth tier 1, which is served by public water and sewer. And this map is showing in the yellow everything inside the Ertl. Townhouses are developable by right in the 10-5 and DR-16 zones, with the DR-55 zone townhouses um, being developed or subject to a compatibility finding per the Baltimore County Code requirements. The Comprehensive Manual Development Policies, or CMDP, establishes the minimum width requirement for townhouses to be 20 feet. A townhouse less than 20 feet in width is permissible within a planned unit development. Research reveal our uh, to planning's research revealed that in the last 10 years, only three of 14 PUD developments approved in the county took advantage of the reduced townhouse width. 
townhouse development proposed in Baltimore County is considered major development and is required to go through the full development plan review processes in accordance with Article 32, Title 4, Subtitle 2 of the Baltimore County Code. The design of a townhouse development must also meet the requirements outlined in BCZR Section 1 B01 and Section 260, which is the Residential Performance Standards, Master Plan 2020, the Comprehensive Manual Development Policies, the Baltimore County Landscape Manual, and any applicable community plans. The Baltimore County Local Open Space Manual requires a provision of open space based on the calculation of a minimum of 1,000 square feet per dwelling unit, which also needs to be provided. Information provided by MBIA, specifically their financial analysis, did highlight some added community benefits like increasing housing choices and creating more socially and economically diverse communities. The department did have difficulty in determining the financial gains and more affordable options as presented through MBIA's information. The lack of access to construction price points for reduced width homes and the varying construction costs in certain areas made it difficult to identify the financial benefit from reducing construction costs or making homes more affordable to citizens as MBIA is asserting. The cost of market rate housing tends to fluctuate in the present economy and housing supply and demand are driving home prices and costs. MBIA also asserts that reducing the width of the townhouse can be offset by making lots deeper and the homes longer and by adding floors to accommodate the reduced width. However, planning felt this argument seems counter to reducing the prices since if a house is narrower but longer and an additional floor to keep the same amenities, costs could potentially stay the same. Housing is one of the crucial components for economic growth and the backbone of strong communities. With regard to the county and countywide enterprise strategic plan outlined by the administration, that plays a critical role in achieving four of the set goals, which are vibrant communities, sustainability, equity, and education. By establishing the minimum 20 foot width for townhouses in Baltimore County in the CMDP, the county was clear in its intent to build homes to address the minimum needs of residents who desire to live in a single family home with a reduced maintenance and financial obligations different from that of a single family detached home. An example of a mixed unit, unit development that serves variable incomes and living needs is the Kingsley Park development in Essex Middle River, which completed construction in 2018 and is shown here on this site plan. The overall intent was to provide a mix of housing choices to serve the many needs of an existing community by offering senior housing, in addition to single family attached and detached homes of varying sizes and price points. Proximity to services, shops, public transportation, schools and open spaces also contribute to the successful mix of housing types, which provide equal importance to each type and affordable units are dispersed throughout the development, making them indistinguishable from market rate homes. The questions that the planning department would like uh, the planning board to discuss when considering the MBIA request to allow the minimum width be reduced to 16 feet would be, do the cost of construction of townhomes justify a reduction of the buy right width within the entire county? Would providing a mix of townhouses within the community help meet the goals of the county's enterprise strategic plan? Providing adequate and properly located parking as well as open space could be pivotal in the design of the townhome community. Reduced with townhome width will increase the potential number of homes on a site, enabling development to reach the maximum density and potentially increase impervious surface areas. Providing more units on the land by right could impact overall quality of design with a loss of open and green space, increase in stormwater runoff and reduce space for landscaping. Amenities may require a greater emphasis for the residents in order to create vibrant, sustainable, and equitable communities. The recommendation to the planning board from the department is to retain the minimum townhouse width of 20 feet and not support it to be 16 feet as a matter of right. It would support a reduced width as a conditional use with the following conditions. That the development of reduced width units be, may not be granted waivers or variances for building height and setback requirements landscaping or local open space requirements, and additionally, environmental areas should not be minimized or altered. 
In a major subdivision, a plan shall show a balanced mixture and equal distribution of townhouses with different widths across the site. Uh, reduced width townhouse development may only be located within growth tier one designated areas of the county. And the following table here to the right would show suggested um, parking provisions for the reduced width townhomes. And that concludes my summary of our last presentation. Thank you, Ms. Nugent. Does the board have any questions? Okay. If I would like, next, excuse me. I, I would like for Ms. Nugent to clarify one of the last things she commented on regarding what the, um, I guess, the planning staff might support with regard to um, what they what they would accept for reduction under certain circumstances. Um. Well, we had in in the report we had stated that. We would consider um, entertaining the idea of reduced width as a mix within an overall subdivision. Um, I think the MBIA is coming behind me next with some more explanation about that. But that um, providing a mix and not just solely doing a development entirely of one width is something that we would support. Um, we also wouldn't, if if the width were to be reduced by right throughout the county, um, we would um, we would not be in favor of a development asking for any waivers or variances um, for height and setback requirements, um, landscaping or local open space requirements. Um, and then we were also recommending that the reduced width would only be located within the growth chair, growth chair one designated areas of the county. Yeah. Um, Jennifer, this is Kathy Wolfson. So am I correct then that 16 feet would be as wide as a double wide trail house trailer? Uh, if that's, I don't know the width of a trailer. I guess well, the part. maximum would be eight to get it down the road. It can't exceed eight feet in width. Okay. Um, and parking. Um, so you have a 16 feet and I, do I assume correctly that the county would still require the same number of parking spaces? Correct. So conceivably. Truly add to the density and subsequently add significantly to the impervious surface needed for the parking. Is that correct? Uh, that is that is planning's view. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions for Miss Nugent? Jennifer. Then thank you, Miss Nugent. Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> Just a quick question. Was there any thought given? I mean, I, I, I know that this would only apply to the growth 1. The, the growth tier 1 areas, but was there any thought given to. Changing the requirements, depending upon, you know, there are some parts of the county where the land is much more expensive. And so if we're going to encourage more affordable housing in those areas. We may want to allow it versus other parts. So is there any consideration given to taking. Taking sort of the, the differential land cost into account. Um, we did not, but um, certainly something that you all could discuss and come up with as recommendations to the council. Any other questions? Okay, if not now, thank you, Ms. Nugent. And now we're thank here from Mr. Ambrosio, MBIA. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Ambrosio. Hello. I don't know if I'm audible, um, but uh, thank you for thank you for having me. 
Uh, I appreciate you giving us the opportunity to talk uh, to you a little bit about this measure. Um, with me on the call are uh, Michael Coughlin and uh, potentially Rob Allmiller, although his internet just went down, so I don't know if he's here, um, to join me in giving a short presentation uh, regarding the uh, proposed resolution. Um, we do have a PowerPoint prepared. I'm not quite sure how to get it up on the screen. Uh, if somebody could maybe help me out with that. I don't seem to have the screen share capability here. Jen, can you pass the presenter to um, Mr. Ambrusso? I don't know how to do that. I don't, where do you do that? So there's a small box, a U-shaped box um, next to your name and you just right click on that. I, I, do, I, think not, I, I do not have that. I think I did it. Okay, let me look. Uh, there we go. All right. Um, uh, all right. I think I'm sharing now. Is that is that up for everybody? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes. Wonderful. Um, thank you very much. So I know that uh, Rob and Michael have been working very uh, fairly closely on this. Um, uh, and uh, they may, I, I don't know, Michael, if you are available, maybe you want to say a couple of words about yourself and introduce yourself before I get started. All right, maybe not. Uh, so I'm just going to jump in. Can you guys, so, can you guys oh. hear me okay? There you are. We can hear you. Okay, great. Hey, everybody. Yeah, Isaac and I will be presenting here today. My name is Mike Coughlin. I'm a civil engineer. work for Morrison Ritchie Associates in the uh, Land Development Division of our Towson office. So uh, thank you for having us. Um, okay, uh, so I'll get started. Um, so we're going to start. Uh, we, we've sort of been working on this, this, uh, this Pro, this uh, proposal for a number of years, uh, actually before, before I got to MBIA, uh, and Michael and Rob have been working very closely on it. Um, so we're going to start with, uh, you know, right now the current comprehensive manual development policies, of course, prohibits uh, the building of 20 foot townhouses by right. Um, they, they have to be in the PUD process. Um, this rule was established in the late 1990s um, as kind of a, a, a sort of check on some of the more egregious examples of poor architectural design uh, during that period. Um, you know, they were referred to as little box houses. Um, a lot of them were, were not particularly desirable in the various communities um, in which they were being built, sold for $100,000, and they were kind of a way for developers to do a quick flip uh, on some of this developable land. Um, so, you know, these 16 foots weren't sustainable, mostly built and sold for under $100,000. Um, developable land was extremely cheap and there wasn't a whole lot of design regulation in place uh, regarding the properties that were being built at the time. Um, so, you know, the, the limitation uh, to 20 foot townhouses was kind of in a response to these poor designs. Um, you know, most of these were built Long before there were pattern books, we, we've put in place hundreds, hundreds of regulations uh, that have been enacted between then and now um, that have resulted in, in quite a bit different design. Uh, Michael, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit more about what the differences are uh, between between then and now. Yeah, absolutely. So there have been a lot of uh, the builders have been able to do a lot more with 16 foot wide townhomes. Um, Here's some, a couple of slides here. I can't really flip through them from my end, but they're able to get uh, more floors uh, than they used to. Here's some good examples of 16-foot townhomes, past and present. Um, they're able to get more floors than they have in the past. They're able to have more architectural elements to them, so they're able to get them to, to look, look better. Um, they're able to get more square footage in them than they have in the past. So there's really been um, a lot that builders can do with the narrow townhomes and what was done in the, the, the 90s and early 2000s. Yeah, so, um, you know, the, 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 uh, 
the differences we've we've compiled a short list of some of the differences that you can get between 16 and 20 foot uh, on this slide. You know, it's a slightly smaller square footage, um, usually one less bedroom, uh, same number of floors, uh, and then generally 20 foot wides can have a have a single front garage or a double rear garage. Um, one of the big differences between the two development, the, the two types of development is that according to our macro analysis of several major builders, um, you know, we found that there was an average cost savings per unit of about 45, 40 to $45,000 um, off the, off the final sale price of a 16 versus a 20 foot home. Um, Michael, I know you were involved in, in the, the creation of that data. If you, can you talk a little bit more about exactly what, what we did? Yeah, we, we reached out to a couple of builders, um, a couple of the larger national builders. Um, we were able to get some, some different price points from them. They were average price points. They weren't per community, but they gave us a rough idea of uh, the price differences between a 16-foot townhome and a 20-foot townhome in terms of what they were selling for in different jurisdictions. Thank you. Um, so, you know, I, the reality... This is yes. Rob Allmiller. Do you mind if I, I, I apologize, my internet went out at the worst time, but I'm on the phone. You want me to take over? Absolutely. That would be great. Thanks, Rob. Okay. Uh, sorry, everyone. And thank you uh, to the planning board for allowing us to make this presentation. Um, I'll try to pick up where Isaac left off. Um, uh, this, this slide that you're looking at now is showing the difference between 16 foot and 20 foot wide townhouses. Um, this community is in Howard County. You'll see that on the right, the 20 foot wides have a front entry garage. Uh, the 16 foot have a parking in the rear. Um, and you'll see that both are built with nice high quality materials and have a nice um, viewscape from the community. Um, some would even say that the ones, the 16s look nicer because the parking is put uh, behind the house. Next slide, please. Uh, another example of 16 foot wides on the left and 20 foot wide homes on the right. Um, there is not a huge visual difference. One of the reasons that these houses were kind of prohibited in the late 90s was because they were seen as small, cheap boxes. And um, you can see now that um, they have evolved greatly from uh, what was built 25 years ago. Next slide, please. So why should we allow 16 foot wide townhouses? You know, like I said, they've evolved a lot since the last 25 years. Um, and it also, some of the benefits are that it increases the supply of workforce housing. Isaac said that 16 foot wides in other jurisdictions sell for about $45,000 less than a 20 foot wide in, um, in, in a competing um, jurisdiction. Uh, this they help incentivize revitalization of priority funding areas. A lot of these priority funding areas um, have lower income housing, which makes new development difficult. And they're also very small parcels, which makes redevelopment of them difficult when we have to build very large you know, townhouses in small areas. Um, they will help increase housing and socioeconomic diversity throughout the county. Um, and they're widely accepted throughout the state. Anne Arundel, Howard, um, Frederick counties all allow 16 foot wide townhouses by right. Harford allows 18 foot by right. In, in fact, Howard County allows 15 foot wide townhouses by right, and many other jurisdictions throughout the state allow them to. Um, reducing the townhouse width could help the county meet its enterprise strategic plan for vibrant communities, as Ms. Nugent pointed out. And 16 foot wide townhouses are still subject to all zoning design, open space, traffic, parking, and environmental requirements. Um, it, they will not decrease the amount of open space. Open space must be provided a thousand square foot per unit. If we do build more units, we will be required to provide more open space. So in fact, it may, also, it may lead to increased open space. It also may lead to the same density built on a smaller footprint which would allow more, more um, pervious space and open space and green space. Next slide, please. So I wanted to, um, Ms. Nugent put together uh, the report for planning. We had the opportunity to, to speak with her earlier this week about it. 
And in a lot of um, instances, she was very complimentary and the planning department was, um, you know, complimentary of 16 foot wide townhouses. I just want to read a couple of these quotes from the report that um, was issued um, and presented to you on September 2nd. A quality and successful development can be achieved by constructing reduced townhouse widths. Recent developments have provided valuable examples of how design features and amenities make townhouse neighborhoods desirable places to live. Providing a mixture of housing choice for different needs and household incomes not only could foster a vibrant community, but also increase the home ownership rate and create communities that are racially and ethically diverse. When construction costs are reduced, developers can invest in neighborhoods that have been previously underinvested and disinvested. This could potentially improve and reduce the equity gap within the county. Um, we agree with all these statements that planning wrote. These are a lot of reasons why 16 foot wide townhouses can be very beneficial to the county. Um, however, we, we're still not sure why planning recommends against them. Next slide, please. Um, now we're just gonna look at some examples of 16 foot wide townhouses uh, in surrounding communities. Uh, this is the Creekside community in Glen Burnie. Uh, all these that you're seeing here are 16 foot wide. Next slide, please. Seem to have. Oh. There you go. I think we're here. Okay, I think we we skipped a couple, but you get the idea. Um, here we are. There you go. There you go. Uh, here's just another view of them. Uh, next slide. Here's a community in um, Howard County. Uh, this has parking in front, and you'll see that you know there's no garages and there's no parking pads. This is on street parking. Next slide, please. In the rears, you can see 16 foot wides have the option of uh, the picture on the left shows single garages and a parking driveway uh, on the left, or they can have an open yard in the back and have the parking out front. Next slide, please. Another community in Howard County. Next slide. And here you can see, you know, these have a single garage in the back and the one on the end uh, on the picture on the right even has a partial fourth floor. So these homes 16 foot wide are typically two bedroom homes and they can be expandable up to three or even four. These are not the same small cheap boxes that were being built 25 years ago. Next slide, please. Uh, a community in Baltimore City. Next slide. And this is a, a, a rear view alley um, of that same community where they have garages and parking pads out back. Next slide. Uh, we missed one more. Not, I, there was there a slide of, um, there we go, homes in Frederick County. These are 16 foot wides, you know, allowed by right there. And last slide, please. So just to wrap it up, you know, townhouse design has evolved significantly since 16s were prohibited in the late 90s. The reasons that we prohibited them are no longer in place. We have design restrictions. We have 260 regulations, pattern books, um, and, and we don't need to prohibit these anymore. 16s are now attractive, well-designed, and meet the needs of county residents. We should be providing more housing choices for our residents. Our typical family is no longer uh, husband, wife, and two and a half kids. We need to provide housing options for our families that may be single parents or empty nesters or young couples that are putting off having kids right away. Um, what we ask is that the planning board recommend to the county council that 16 foot townhouses be allowed by right. Um, I'm happy to take any questions that the planning board may have. Thank you, Mr. Ambrosio. Does the planning board have any questions at this time? Yes, yeah. Madam, I have a question. Uh, Mr. Avery? Yes. Do you anticipate using the, the, the additional four feet for parking or to expand the number of units? Uh, it, it could be used for either. Um, as planning report pointed out, it may allow development to realize more density. Uh, we will not be going over our density because that is set 
by the underlying zoning. But we may be able to realize more density, but that's only if we can comply with all open space, all parking, all traffic, school, landscaping, design requirements. So in some cases, it may allow more density. In other cases, it, it may result in the same number of houses on a smaller environmental footprint. Rob, if I could ask a question, one of the challenges the county has uh, is the fact that we have very little building lots left. I think the last time we got a report, there was 2,100 building lots in the county um, left uh, for development. And I, I think those numbers are a year old. So it's, it's probably down dramatically from that at this point, because I don't know what we build a year, but I know it's it's north of 1,300 units a year. So. The challenge I have, um, I'm for the 16 foot, but I, I would want us to be able to get greater density out of these developments. Um, that's the way to lower housing prices, as you know, and, and you can speak to this better than I can. One of the major inputs these days is not the actual construction cost. It's the land cost and projects just don't make sense. So of the land that's left in the county to develop inside Ertl, um, many projects don't make sense just because you can't get enough density out of it. So what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I agree. I mean, one of the reasons is that this came about for MBIA is that Baltimore is a built out county. We have an Ertl, we are largely built out. There are no more greenfield development options. So what we've been asked by the county and what the market requires of builders and developers is to um, invest and revitalize older areas. And I'll tell you, it's, it's a lot easier to go out and develop a 50 acre farm than it is to assemble land inside the Ertl and redevelop it. And um, this will allow us to, um, it, it's another tool that we can use to help incentivize redevelopment of, you know, older neighborhoods and neighborhoods that where the housing prices may not be as high. Um, and, and this is a, you know, I personally had an experience where I had a project in, um, in Eastern Baltimore County and it did a pencil out because there was a ceiling on, on housing prices in the neighborhood. And I was, you know, required to build 20 foot wide townhouses and, if I could have done 16s, I, I could have I could have made it happen. Um, but the project wasn't large enough to support an expensive PUD process. And although 16s are allowed by by PUD, PUDs are very, um, you know, there's a lot of politics involved. They're very expensive. There's a lot of up, upfront design costs. Um, and so a lot of people, you know, avoid them. And um, it's one of the reasons that we really don't, we don't agree with the conditional use that planning has um, proposed. We think that's a de facto restriction on 16s. If we need to meet all these hurdles, it really is gonna drive up the cost. If we have to mix in a 16 next to an 18 next to a 20, that drives up the cost of construction by making it more complex. It makes it a more difficult project to, to sell. And if I'm trying to do a small, in, revitalization project and I'm getting 10 homes and I have to build three different types of home that that makes it very difficult to to, to sell so thank you Mr. Brambrosio I appreciate that does any of the planning board have any other further questions at this time no, I we, do Madam Chair we, yes Mr. Uh, Perlow or Mr. Hackman well, I, I was just going to say, I, I agree with Todd, although I think, Rob, your argument is a little, can you guys submit a market study or some report that substantiates your claim that it's 40 to $45,000 less? Because it, what, what concerns me is Mr. Coughlin, I believe it was, said that they reached out to a couple of national home builders and got some information. Is there an actual report that you know can substantiate the claim that it's forty to forty-five thousand less? We don't have a report in our possession, and we haven't authorized one. Uh, you know, our position so far is that smaller houses cost less to build, 
and they sell for less. And um, we think that's kind of a common sense um, argument. And planning asked us to put some numbers together. So we did an internal study with a few national home builders and, and came up with those averages um, from other jurisdictions to try to figure out how much less expensive a 16 foot wide in Baltimore County may be than a current 20 foot. Thank we you. Don't... Any other questions? Questions. questions or can I make a comment? Oh, make a comment, Mr. Perlow. Thanks very much. I would suggest to you, since I'm the, the title guy, that it's a good $40,000 difference throughout the metropolitan area, and Arundel to Frederick to Howard, um, up to Carroll County between the 16s and the 20 footers. They showed a picture earlier of Parkview Trails that was built over off of Johnny Cake, and I did that entire project back in the 90s. I would tell you the people that were able to buy those homes though for 100 or $130,000 were buying it because they were able to buy affordable housing. Those houses now sell in the 215, 230 range, and those are still affordable housing for that area. Um, it's what people can afford, as well as people that can afford housing that's gonna be built in the White Marsh area, townhouses, um, you know, in the, I'm trying to get my thing adjusted, I'm sorry, um, in the 340 range to 390 range for townhouses, for 20 foot townhouses. Um, we talk about, we talk about our county is an aging county. Um, you talk about the cost, lumber is up 30 to 35% just on the housing. So if you take a 16 footer versus a 20, you know you've got a major difference just in the lumber, not just in the flooring and everything else, just in the lumber. We have limited density as everybody's talked about in, um, in our county. Some additional density that you might get out of this is not a bad thing. We're gonna be limited because by our hurdle and our metropolitan district line. We all talk about this all the time. We don't wanna violate that hurdle line. And we're not gonna have housing anytime soon based on the sales of housing over the last 18 months. A lot of the inventory of lots throughout the state of Maryland has been sold and is being built as we speak. And you're gonna see a vacuum for the next four, five, six years till projects may become online if there's any land available in some of these other counties. And there will be a major run up of prices of everything that's there. The 16 footers, I've watched them. I transfer a lot of houses in Baltimore City that are 12 foot wide. How do I know? Because we have to get a survey on each property. 14 foot wide, 16, not too many 20s in the city. Once in a while, they'll put two 12-footers together to make a 24-footer, but that's the odd case in Baltimore City. The people that are buying in Fells Point, in Federal Hill, in Canton, are very happy with their 14 and 16-foot house. They make them special. They're able to buy them in the 230, 240 range. They are paying higher property taxes. We understand that, but they still wanna live there that I was with the national builder meeting on 180 houses and uh, lots in Canton. And, you know, knowing that he wanted 16 footers there in the city, because that's what he thinks the young um, millennials are, or whatever the group is, excuse me, if I have it wrong for the name of the present 25 to 35 year olds. I do have a problem with the planning staffs wanting to limit the 16s in the PUD. They talk about that we would lose open space, stormwater management, landscaping, everything else. I disagree with that. The planning board, it would still have to go through them. Even to limit it, that it has to be in tier one. If you could find a three acre site and be able to build 30 or 40 houses there that are well designed and approved by the planning books and by the planning department, I don't see that we should be limiting that just to the close in. Should we have enough stormwater management and clearance and everything else that we need? Absolutely. But I do believe that it's really something that is right for the county. Um, in Owings Mills, Newtown, we do a lot of resales there as well. In White Marsh, a lot of resales where 16 and 18 footers were built. 
maybe not as pretty as they should have been back in the 80s and 90s, but now we are that much tougher on the design criteria. And I really believe this is something that Baltimore County should do for the future, especially as we become a minority county and should be providing affordable housing that is something less than the top of the line. Um, people buy top of the line automobiles, Mercedes or, or Tesla or whatever, but they also buy Hondas and Toyotas as well because that's what their income and their, their affordability allows. And I think we should have that choice here in Baltimore County as well. Thank you, Mr. Perlow. Does anyone else have any questions or comments? I do. And that is uh, Paul Hartman. Uh, Paul, Chair for, Mr. Okay. Hartman, go ahead. Uh, in Towson, we have uh, two developments that have 16 foot uh, townhouses, uh, Towson Green and Towson Muse, and they're, they're both fine developments, uh, but I would not think they were fine if they were all 16s. So therefore I'm opposed to just allowing 16 by right. Both of those projects were PUDs and they turned out really good. So there is an availability of 16s in, in Baltimore County. If uh, you go through the PUD process, which allows uh, more community input. And, uh, you know, in the case of uh, Towson Green, I was uh, involved with that uh, from a community standpoint. And uh, the, it turned out much better with community input involved than it had started out. So um, I think we should uh, keep the existing um, regulations as far as uh, townhomes are uh, concerned and uh, uh, keep the below 20 foot uh, houses as part of the PUD process. You can also get a density bonus uh, by going through the PUD process too. So. Um, there's a lot of benefits uh, to that, and I, I uh, um, think that we should keep the, uh, the, the regulations as they are. Thank you very much for your comments. Any other comments from the board? Yes, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, I would like to make a Steve Heinel here. Uh, I'd like to say that I'm generally in favor of creating more affordable opportunities for home ownership. Uh, one of the things that I've experienced in knowing people and living in communities that have uh, have been in townhouse communities is that uh, you do not want to reduce the parking uh, in these communities to accommodate more housing with less parking. I mean, it is just it would be unrealistic to think that these houses are going to have less than two cars. They constantly have people over. That's a good thing. But at the end of the day, my concern would have less to do with the actual living space and more to do with accommodating uh, parking, because honestly, it creates so much uh, uh, animosity in communities when you can't support the people who are living there with proper parking. So I'd keep that in mind with regard to uh, w when we're building these houses, great, let more people be homeowners, uh, but be, keep in mind the fact that somebody's got to park somewhere and it gets ugly. So that's all. Thank you, Mr. Heinel. Any other comments? I agree with Paul Hartman. Oh, thank you. Any other comments? Okay. If not, thank you for your input, Mr. Ambroso. At this time, I would like to call on you that have completed the online registration posted on the Baltimore County's website to speak on this topic. For those who wish to provide written comments during this hearing, you can do so by typing them into the host chat box and comments will be read to the board members during this meeting. Please refer to the online instructions for entering comments and procedures for speaking during this meeting. Remember, speakers only have two minutes. And right now, our first two speakers are signed up are Mr. A. Miller or Mr. Ambroso. Do you still have things you'd like to say? This is Mr. Allmiller. I would just like to respond to the, the last comment about parking. The parking requirements okay. for 16 foot wide townhouses are the same as for 20 foot wide townhouses. So there will not be a lack of parking because the size of the house is different. Thank you. I also believe that we have a question in the chat um, or that was going in the chat for, for Rob. Um, from Ms. Panero. 
Yeah, it looks like she said she's having a microphone issue. So, Katie, if you want to put your question in the chat. She's asking, um, do you foresee developments being made up of all 16 foot townhomes or will they be a mix? It could be either. What we're asking for is that they could be made up of all 16 foot wide townhouses. When you do a mix, it adds complexity to the construction, drives up the costs, and it really negates any cost savings of doing a 16 foot wide. Okay, thank you. Gentlemen, is there anything else you'd like to add before I call on the other speakers? I mean, uh, people that wanna make comments? Nancy, this is Jennifer. Can I just make a follow up to Rob's statement? Absolutely. In, in our thinking about varying or mixing townhouse widths within a single development, we're not looking, say for example, if you were to have a group of five townhouses, we're not looking because it, it doesn't make practical construction sense to throw in three different width townhomes within a townhouse group. It, it's just to Rob's point, the construction cost is not feasible. However, say you were to have a, a, a townhouse development community of about 53 houses all in, in different groups, we would probably, you know, envision more that you could potentially do um, varying widths in townhouse groups. So I just wanted to kind of, that was where we were coming from. Thank you for your comments, Ms. Nugent. Okay, next, moving to our next uh, speaker is Mr. Tim Hartman. Uh, are you here? Yes, ma'am. You have me? two minutes. Go ahead, sir. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I'm a longtime Baltimore County resident. I've been living here since I graduated college about 20 years ago and uh, have spent the majority of my career actually as a home builder in the county. Uh, and I'm actually here today representing DR Horton, uh, which is uh, the largest home builder in the country. And just to kind of uh, give a little bit of color around what, you know, we see throughout the rest of kind of the state and kind of how we look at things. Um, we build a lot of 16 footers. We build them in Frederick. We build, build them in Montgomery County. We'll build them in Prince George's County. Much like the cost difference between a 20 and a 24 foot townhome, I think the $40,000 number that was quoted is, is pretty accurate in terms of what a 16 footer versus a 20 would cost and what a 20 versus a 24 would cost just as a comparison. There are about 400 square feet different if you just use the same box, meaning a 16 foot wide by 40 foot deep and a 20 foot wide by 40 foot deep. And at, you know, $60 a square foot, which frankly is not even in the ballpark of what it costs to build a house anymore in today's world, you know, that alone is $25,000. Um, and so I think that the $40,000 number is, is actually very defendable and, and could be proven out very uh, in a you know, fairly easy manner. You know, at seventy dollars a square foot, that's thirty thousand. And what nobody—I uh, didn't hear from anybody tonight—is the development that goes along with a forty with a sixteen-foot townhouse. You know, is also less road, less sidewalk. You know, it's narrower width, close to the development, and you should actually see additional savings on the other side as as far as producing that lot, and uh, and and also which also drives part of that forty thousand dollar. Uh, Delta in, in what you could sell 16 for versus a 24. I think as we look at communities and we try to plan them in, as a whole and try to hit broad markets where we're offering um, products for, you know, all sizes and a, at all levels and all price points, it is kind of a missing, it is kind of the missing price point in Baltimore County. And, um, in terms of delivering um, workforce housing or, or, or housing that can be achieved by, you know, everybody, you know, part of what holds up the development process is sometimes going through the, you know, through the long putt, which we do all the time and we're very happy to do it when, when the time is right. But, you know, in a 30 or 40 lot subdivision, it doesn't really make sense to do that kind of process. And and frankly, adds a lot of time and a lot of cost to the project that basically goes right to the cost of the house at the end. 
So, you know, being able to bring lots on sooner for less money um, and being able to offer a price point that hasn't been seen or achieved by others in the marketplace is, you know, really going to be a game changer, in my opinion, for being able to offer, you know, products to folks that, you know, maybe had never thought they could buy a new home, but today they can buy a new home because, you know, we were able to achieve something that, you know, hadn't been achieved in the marketplace up until then. Thank you, Mr. Hartman. I appreciate your comments. Okay, right now, uh, is there any, Ms. Tracy, do we get anyone else signed up to speak? I only had those two speakers. Just those two. All right, thank you yeah. so very much. Okay, right now, thank you to, for everyone that spoke this evening on this matter. The planning board will take into consideration all the comments from this evening's meeting. Mrs. Bensley. Are there any written written comments on this topic? No, there are not, Madam Chair. Thank you so much. At this time, we have no one signed up to speak. Oh, no. So uh, thank you, Ms. Nugent, for your presentation. This item is tentatively scheduled for a vote at the October 7th planning board meeting. If there are no other questions at this time, we'll conclude our public hearing. Do I hear any questions from the board? If not, then let's call for a motion to adjourn. Motion. A second. Move to adjourn. Thank you all for your time this evening. Thank you to the planning board and thank you to the planning staff and all of our speakers this evening. Everyone have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. You too. Thank you.